What do you feel about your performance last night in the debate? I was honored to come out as the winner of a debate where it was literally my first political debate ever. Other people on that stage have been in many political debates in their lifetime. I'm an outsider to politics, but it turned out that was actually my big advantage last night is that I was able to speak freely from the heart without pre-scripted slogans, and I think that proved our success on the stage. It almost looked like you're having fun up there. I was having a ton of fun, actually. I was looking at my clock, and then suddenly it's almost two hours is up. I said, I thought we we're just getting warmed up. So I'm looking forward to the next debate. Israel came up also. You had a lot of backlash about the remarks that you said about cutting the military aid to Israel. Do you regret saying that? Well, you know what's funny is I actually never said that. So the reality is, and I've learned about how partisan politics works. There's a lot of other professional politicians on the stage who know that my rise is going up. So they're thinking about what words they can put in my mouth. Here's actually what I said. What I said is if our relationship with Israel ever gets Israel to the point of being so strong that Israel doesn't even need our aid anymore, that will actually be a mark of success of a true friendship. But to be clear, we would never cut off aid to Israel until Israel told us they were ready for it. The truth is this. The U.S.-Israel relationship will be stronger by the end of my first term than it has ever been in U.S. history and than it ever will be under any of those other administrations if anybody else is elected. And here's why. I view it as a friendship, not a client transactional relationship, a friendship. And true friends help each other stand strong on their feet with fortitude. How would we do that? I want to lead Israel into Abraham Accords 2.0 in whatever way we can as the United States contribute to that diplomatically. Get Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, Indonesia into that pact. I think the most anti-Semitic element of foreign policy has been to hold Israel hostage over the Palestine question and stop Israel from integrating itself into the security infrastructure and economic inf infrastructure of the Middle East and elsewhere. That needs to end. So and I, I will diplomatically lead the way on that. And the other area where I think the U.S.-Israel partnership is critical is staying strong with respect to making sure Iran never, never, ever becomes a nuclear power, even has basic nuclear capabilities. We will never allow that to happen on our watch. And that's the source of a true partnership and friendship rather than a check the box. Okay, I checked the box and said that this is how much I'm, money I'm going to give in a given year, which is whether establishment politicians like to stick to a script. I prefer to talk authentically. And yes, they will distort what I say, but that's not going to stop me from speaking the truth. So I read your remarks and you said that by 2028, if there are Abraham Accords 2.0, as you said, we saw Arabia and Indonesia and Malaysia, um, and maybe Israel would not need that. But again, um, we still have Hamas and yes. Iran and Lebanon and Syria. Yes. Uh, this is something that, you know, is bipartisan today, not only for Israel, but an American interest to have that aid for Israel as a democracy in the Middle East. Yes. So maybe you've changed your mind and no. not just misquoted? No, I think that I've not changed my mind, but I do want to be crystal clear. That was a long form, free ranging podcast. And, and you actually said it correctly. What I did say is when by 2028, if we've gotten Israel to the point where that is no longer required, that would be a mark of success. There are literally false headlines that then say Vivek proposes cutting aid to Israel after that. False. And I want to be crystal clear. We will not cut any aid to Israel until Israel tells us as a friend that they don't need it anymore. But true friends actually can be honest with each other. And that's the kind of relationship that I want with Israel, not just a transactional one. And look, a lot of other professional politicians that, threat that are threatened by my rise, they're going to distort that because they know that could be an attack point. But the good news is I trust the voters in this country and I trust listeners, frankly, even of your network, to be able to tell the difference and understand the truth of what I've said. And you know, the funny thing is I, on a personal note, have a great longstanding relationship with Israel. My, some of my greatest business partners are in Israel. I've been there countless times in the last decade. I was actually, this, I'm not Jewish, but I was actually invited into and joined the Jewish Society of Yale. The uh, rabbi there is actually one of my closest personal advisors in my life. And so I have a lot of personal affinity for Israel, but that's not what informs my policy because I'm running for president of the United States. The reason I want a strong Israel is because that is in the interest of the United States. And that aid that goes to Israel that goes to investment in the United States, industrial capacity here. So it's a clear win-win, and it would be senseless to cut that off unnecessarily. Another question um, is regarding future plans if you don't win. Um, I'm going to win. <laughs> and, and, and the other candidates I would like to think about their future plans, some of them may have roles in my administration. Even if it's not in my administration, some of them may be good governors in states. 
And you know what? The federal government's not going to solve all the problems in the United States. A lot of this is going to have to be driven at the state and local level, some of it even outside of government. And so that's the way I view it. Will we see you as number two for Trump as vice president? I think a more likely scenario is you're going to see Trump as an advisor to me when I am the president. And I think that, you know, that's a better role in many ways, both for Trump and for me. For me to be the president, I can unite this country. I can speak to the next generation. I can build a strong moral mandate, not just 50.1, but a Reagan 1980 style landslide, young and old, black and white, urban and suburban. I think I have a capacity to do that in a way that nobody else in this race does. But Trump has great experience, and so I want to take him as an advisor, even a sort of mentor during my time in the White House, and I think that's going to be the better fit. Will you pardon him? Yes. Don't you think that with no experience, very young, a lot of experience in tech and in economy and finance, but no within the administration and in politics, that is something that could hurt you as the president of the U.S.? I think it's actually going to help me. If you look at many of our current problems, I don't think we want to turn over to the keys to the same generation that got us into that mess. I grew up into a generation with the Iraq war, weapons of mass destructions that do not exist, the 2008 financial crisis, and then the ignominious bank bailouts that came on both sides on the back of that. Both of those are bipartisan problems. It's not a Republican versus Democrat issue. I think it's going to take someone coming from the outside as an independent voice, a patriot who speaks the truth, to actually reunite this country, lead us forward, and set an example for the rest of the free world of what is possible when America is itself strong. So I don't view it as political inexperience. I view it as actual experience outside of politics that brings a fresh perspective to politics, which we badly need in this country. And I'm the only person in this race who's actually bringing it. You're not a gimmick. We're not going to see it end in a few months after you had a lot of TV time and air time, uh, but with no real chances of winning the candidacy. Yes, I think we're just getting warmed up. And the truth is, you know, we're raising two young sons. My wife is a successful surgeon. I've lived the full American dream, founding many companies. I enjoy what I've been doing the last few years, writing books, going on TV. That's fun. That's great. Build companies. I enjoy that. We're making a serious sacrifice to do this. Okay, my three-year-old son, my one-year-old son, they're upstairs right now. They're going to go home. I'm heading to Iowa from here. You don't make these sacrifices lightly. And my wife, even when we started on this campaign, she asked me, are you sure we don't want to wait 20 years before we embark on an adventure like this? And I thought about it. We thought about it together. The fact is, I don't think we have 20 years left. I think if we don't get this right in the next decade, maybe before my kids graduate from high school, maybe even in the next four years, I don't think we're going to have a country left, not the same one that I grew up in. But if we get this right, it can be a country even greater than the one I grew up in. And so for me, that's a sense of duty. And that's not something that I take lightly. And so what many people see as a rocket ship rise in the campaign, I view as just really just a warm up for what's actually coming. So you're not a gimmick. Far from it. I think I'm grounded in truth, grounded in substance. That's the way I've led my whole career, right? I've developed five FDA-approved medicines. One of them is a life-saving drug for kids. These aren't light matters, right? I built the leading competitor to the likes of BlackRock and the ES anti-ESG arena. Everything I've taken on, I've taken on with seriousness. I think these issues are too serious to take on lightly. I do like having fun on the debate stage. Don't get me wrong. I think it's important to... You know, I enjoy my fitness. I enjoy speaking honestly with voters. So we're staying sane and having fun along the way. But don't mistake that for a loss of seriousness about the ultimate vision for this country. That's actually what's going to allow us to be more successful in reuniting the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much.